guys, this morning we're going to talk about glazing and kind of the um, process that you need to go through in order to make your art form look really nice. Um, glazing can kind of make or break your piece. So it's something that you really definitely want to put some quality time into and then um, some thought into. And it's not a place that you want to rush through the process. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of uh, results that you will get if you don't properly glaze your bisque ware. So we'll go over the different types of glazes that we have in the studio and then I'll walk you through the process that you will go through um, depending on which type of glaze that you use. So glazing is kind of one of those um, processes where you have to be really patient. Um, it is a bit time consuming because we brush our glazes on. Um, so there's different types of glazing. You can spray it on, you can dip it, you can brush it. Um, there's, you know, a plethora of things that you can do with it. But for our purposes in this studio, we're, we have all um, brush glazes. So the process takes just a little bit longer than if you were to dip it. So, um, and that's okay. Um, it's really good for beginners to kind of walk through that process. Um, but uh, the nice thing about glaze is it doesn't lie. Uh, once it's cooked in the kiln and it comes out, you see the results immediately. And sometimes they're really, really great and you're really happy with the results. And other times it's, um, it will leave you very unfulfilled and your form might be, not be very desirable, I guess. So um, do prep for it. Do think about your colors. Do think about the combinations um, before you apply it to your art form. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about the different types of glazes that we have and the process of glazing. So we've got a variety of different brushable glazes here in the studio. So I'm just going to briefly go over which is which and how you use them. Um, and then it will be kind of up to you to kind of experiment and decide what colors you want to put together and how you want to put them together. Um, it's always a good idea to make a test tile um, if you have time to do that. Um, we've got tons of extra um, textile pieces that you are welcome to use. Um, but if you're crunched for time, um, you just do the best that you can and just make an educated um, guess at what colors will work best together. There's lots of information online in regards to color combos. So I'll always encourage you to kind of do a little bit of research before you actually do your glaze application. So those are things that we'll talk about um, during our studio time. So the first type of glaze I'm going to talk about is underglaze. And we've kind of already touched on this a little bit. So we know that underglaze doesn't have flux in it. So it's not going to melt um, the way that an overglaze does. But uh, I wanted you to know just a few additional things about underglaze because there's two different types. So we have a velvet underglaze. And velvet underglazes, they're this like semi-translucent underglaze. They have this appearance of like velvet when it's left unglazed. Um, but it will intensify if it's covered with um, a clear coat or an additional gloss glaze. And the velvet underglaze can be used in detailed design work. Um, it kind of intensifies in brightness um, and they're very rich in color and they can be used all over your bisque ware. So there's no like single place that you're allowed to use this. And then we have um, just a lug underglaze and they're also really intense. They're opaque colors so you're they're not going to be translucent and these are really ideal for covering a large amount of area quickly. And this is what um, a lot of people use, well, either one of these, they use for the graffiato technique or stenciling, um, things like that. But it goes on really easily and smooth. Um, they're really ideal for painting, um, if you want a watercolor effect, um, any kind of wax resist or anything like that. Um, they are dinnerware safe um, and that you, on any of these glazes, it will either say it on the label or um, sometimes there's a little picture and that will tell you that they are dinnerware safe. Um, these can also be covered with a clear coat. Um, that way you have that shiny finish when it is finished. And these come in a variety of colors as well. 
Um, so if you are going to pick out an underglaze, um, here's the tile. They have what it looks like without the clear coat, and then here it is on the other side with the clear coat. So if you're kind of wondering, um, the color does intensify just slightly. But for the most part, you're going to get what it looks like um, in the jar, especially if you're not going to put a clear coat on it. Um, you can see it almost matches exactly. So those are our underglazes, and we're going to come back to those in just a little bit. Um, but we're going to go on to these glazes, and then we'll talk about different combinations that you can do. The next type of glaze that we have is the LG Series Amco brand, and the LG um, gloss, um, it, glo it flows, you know, slightly during the firing process because it does have glass in it, but it does give you a really nice, smooth, high gloss finish. And all the glazes that we use in this studio are cone 05, so that's the firing temperature which matches our low fire clay. Um, the earthenware that we use, which is 04, 05. And you can fire these through 06, um, but I would say that would be probably the lowest temperature that you would want to fire any of this stuff. Um, but the LG uh, series, they fire, um, like I said, to that glossy finish. And um, they're really great because if you do mess up anything in the glazing application, like if you have any like major drips or anything, they often kind of self-correct. So this is a really great glaze for beginners. Then we go down to our opalescent glazes, and they also have a high gloss similar um, to the LG Service, so they're really not that different. Um, the opalescents are, uh, I would say they have a little bit of a you're not going to be able to see it, so I hate to use the word shimmer, but they do sometimes have a little bit of a shimmer, but these are more translucent. So your LG series and your underglazes are going to be more opaque, where this is going to be translucent. So you're going to be able to see through it. So these are really great to layer over your underglazes. So when you're thinking about your color combinations, um, that's something that you could do. Um, the colors are more intense um, and brilliant than the, those of many other glazes. Um, they are leadless, and uh, the ones that we have in this studio are food safe, so you're good to use those on any of your kitchenware that you uh, create in studio. Um, yeah, so that's our opalescent glazes. And then we have our artist choice glazes, which are my favorite. The Artist Choice glazes, they kind of have these special effects um, that imitate like an artist or a potter's um, type of glaze. Um, they kind of resemble a high fire glaze. So yes, this emulates kind of that effect that you get with uh, the hotter glaze and a gas kiln, which is really nice because a lot of Beginner artists don't have access to those uh, gas kilns, especially, you know, if you're in a high school setting. Um, so thankfully, Amco um, came out with a glaze that kind of imitates that. Um, but like I said, these are Cone 5 oxidation glaze, but it looks like a high fire reduction stoneware glaze. Um, so if you take the additional classes, ceramics 2 and 3, then you learn more kind of about that, those types of things. Um, but you don't have the cost or the trouble of the high fire, which is nice. The Artist Choice glazes, they look best when they're applied um, in several layers and when you layer them on to an additional color or you put a color on top of them. So again, um, they look fine when they're by themselves, but layering them onto another color or underneath um, a color that you like is going to give you better results and you'll be happier with your art form at the end of the day. You, um, for the Artist Choice glazes, you can dip and you can pour, um, but for the most part, we are going to be brushing our glazes on uh, just because I only buy them in the six, 16 ounce uh, jars. Um, so it's just easier for you to brush your glazes on. So if you ever read or ever see um, on the internet that you can dip or um, 
pour these, you absolutely can, but for this studio, we're gonna be brushing them. The other thing about the Artist Choice glazes is some of the colors do have little crystals in them and do, do not sometimes I see kids kind of picking them off or beginners picking them off you do not want to do that you want those crystals on there because that's what's going to help give the glaze its color and the thing about the crystals is you don't want them sitting down at the bottom of your piece before they go into the kiln. So if you ever have that, those are the ones that you would maybe want to take off. Or if you see them while you're brushing it on, you would just want to move it up on your piece. Um, because if it's at the very bottom, then it's going to melt a lot. And then it's going to get stuck to that kiln shelf or we'll have to grind it. Um, and it's just extra work that you don't necessarily have to do if you're paying attention during your glazing process. So just one more time, these do not have glass in them. Um, these do have flux in them. There's other stuff in there. If you can think about the periodic table mixed up in a jar, that's what we got going on. Um, but for a beginner, you know, you really just need to focus on the application. And if you continue down your road of ceramics, then you can le learn more about the recipes and how these colors are made and the different things that you can do with them. But you guys are going to want to layer your glazes. Um, and so I'll have a little handout print out for you so to help guide you kind of through the process so you're not just kind of hanging out there high and dry. So remember I talked about if you want to just apply a single color that's going to be really opaque, these are the brands that um, would be really good for that. So that this is more of the effect that you're going to get. It's really opaque. Um, you're not going to be able to see the bisque wear. It doesn't run very much and you're going to get a really solid block of color. So these brands are really great for that. So if that's something that you would like to achieve, then I would go with the Mako Stroke, stroke or Coat brand or the Blick Essential Gloss Glaze. And these are both located on the cart. If you're wanting to get more of an effect like this, then you're going to want to use the Amco glazes. So either the Potter Choice glazes, so this guy here, um, you can get this effect or you can use the LG series or the opalescent series, which really these should be used on a red glaze most of the time, but I have found that they work perfectly fine with the white earthenware that we use. So um, if you do read that anywhere or see it anywhere, you're, you're, you're good to go. I've, students have been using it for 20 years this way and it, it works just fine. Um, but if you're wanting to get either types of these effects with layering, then you're gonna definitely wanna use the Amco glazes that we hear, we have here in the studio. So now let's talk about proper glazing. So this pinch pot, uh, there is a correct uh, proper way of glazing, which is in the green. And then we have the improper way of glazing, which is here in the blue. So this is a result of either not stirring the glaze often enough, not applying the glaze thick enough, and not applying enough layers. This is the result that you will get. And this is what I talk about when glaze doesn't lie. So when it comes out of the kiln, we're gonna be able to see your application. Did you do it correctly? Did you do it incorrectly? So um, when I talk about, you know, glaze kind of makes or breaks your project, this is what I mean. So you've spent a lot of time working on your art form. So don't just slap the glaze on with no thought um, and no, I guess, um, commitment to your work because then this is the result you're going to get and you're not going to want to show your work off and you're not going to be proud of it. You can apply too much glaze and if you apply too much glaze then you get these bubbles um, and what happens is air gets trapped underneath the layers of glazes and it causes these air pockets basically um, and these the edges of the bubbles when they pop they become really really sharp so it's like a shard of glass because remember this has flux in it so um, 
you know, that's always the big question with beginners. Can I apply too much glaze? And the answer is definitely yes. You can also get what we call crackling, um, which just looks like cracks in the glaze. And it's the same thing. You know, they tend to kind of chip and you have like these shards of glass that are exposed. And at this point, you know, you can't really do anything with this. Um, you're not going to want to give it to anyone really. I mean, if you were going to keep it, you would just put it on a shelf. Um, uh, so nobody can touch it because they would hurt themselves. So really, this is probably going to go in the trash can. After you have all your colors picked out and your supplies ready to go, you guys are going to want to wipe down your bisqueware with a sponge. And the reason you want to do this is because sometimes your bisqueware sits for a little bit before you get to the glazing process. And so dust can settle on it or maybe something exploded in the kiln. And so you have other small uh, bis particles that are sitting on the surface of your art form. So you just want to make sure that it's really clean um, and there's no dust on it or oils on it that could affect your glaze in the long run. The next step is to apply a line at the bottom of your piece so you know where to apply the wax. We do not ever want to glaze our bisqueware on the foot because as we know, glaze has flux in it and it will melt. And when it melts in the kiln, it will get stuck to the kiln shelf. And sometimes you can get it off, but most of the time you end up breaking the bottom half of your art form. So in order to um, eliminate that, we're going to apply wax to the foot because anywhere that you have wax on your bisque is going to repel your glaze and so you don't necessarily have to worry about it too much. Although you will still want to wipe it down with a sponge before you fire. Notice I have my piece on my turntable and my pencil is flat against the surface of my turntable and I'm just turning my piece letting the pencil lead create a line. It's about one eighth of an inch from the foot of your art form. For my next step, I'm going to apply the wax. I'm first going to place a paper towel on top of my turntable so I don't get wax on the surface. And then I'm gonna dip my brush into the crock pot um, where we have our wax. Now we have several waxing stations around the room. Um, just make sure that the wax is turned on um, or else it will do you no good. And you're going to apply the wax underneath the line that you have created. So normally you can just take the brush and you can just kind of glide it across the surface of your paper towel as long as it's pressed up against your bisqueware and it will stay below that line. But you do want to make sure that you're focusing and you're paying attention because if you slip or you get kind of messy, anywhere where that wax is applied, your glaze will not adhere to your bisqueware. So if it gets splattered or you accidentally um, lose focus and you get kind of a wobbly line, there's no way to fix it. Um, so please pay close attention when you're applying your wax. You only need to apply wax in one layer. Um, that is perfectly substantial. That's enough. That's all you need. Once you have the outside edge of your foot uh, layered in wax, you're then going to flip your form and you're going to apply wax to the actual foot of your bisqueware because that's where it's going to sit on the kiln shelf. Again, you only need one layer of wax. Be sure to leave the paper towel underneath the foot of your bisqueware so it doesn't get on your turntable. And once you have the bottom of the foot um, completely waxed, it will only take a few seconds for this to dry and you'll be ready for your first application of glaze.
Before I actually start applying my glaze, I am going to record the information for my glazing. Um, this is for several reasons. One, to keep you organized in regards to what color you're using because beginners always say, oh, I'll remember, I'll remember, and then they come back a couple days later and they have no idea what color they use. Um, and they're like, well, I'll just go look at the jar. But the problem is, well, we already know that when you look at the jar, um, the color doesn't always match when it comes out of the kiln. And some of the colors in the jar look really similar. So for example, amber, moss green, dark yellow, they all look like this rust color, but they all have very, very different results. So this will help you keep organized. And if you want to remake the color, you'll know your recipe. So short, um, you know, mixing your own glazes, this is the best that you can do um, in replicating a color. So for my my um, base that I'm going to be glazing, I'm going to use the Artist Choice Exotic Blue, and that's going to be my first color that I lay down. So that's what I'm going to write under first color. That's the first one that's going to touch the bisque. So I'm going to write Exotic Blue, and I'm just going to put AC for Artist Choice, and I'm going to do three layers. My second color that I'm going to do is going to be the blue bell. So I'll put that down and I'm just going to put OP for opalescent and I'm going to do three layers of blue bell. At this point, I think that those are the only two colors that I'm going to use. If I do end up putting a third color on here, then I'll record it at that time. But for now, I'm pretty happy with this color selection. Um, maybe I'll change my mind here in a little bit, but I have my recording. So now I'm ready to go ahead and start applying the glaze to my bisque ware. So before you start glazing, you guys are going to need a few things um, before you start. You're going to want to put saran wrap over your turntable because this will help you have a quick cleanup um, because the chance of you getting on glaze on your turntable is pretty high, probably 100%. So this will just uh, be beneficial at the end when you're ready to clean up. You're going to need a brush and find a brush that has really fluffy bristles. So don't use one that's really stiff. Sometimes you'll see um, these laying around, so this is just a really cheap brush um, that we use for other things. So make sure it's really nice and fluffy. And then you're going to want to grab either a fork or a spoon from your basket so you can stir your glaze. So once you have all those supplies ready, grab your glaze, take the lid off, you're going to take your spoon, and we're going to stir this glaze up because it's been sitting. And we know that our glaze has particles in it. So again, think of the periodic table mixed up in a jar. We've got to mix all that stuff up. If you don't mix this properly, then the color is not going to turn out the way that you desire. So remember this example? You're going to end up with this blue down here, and we're going more for this green. We want it to be opaque. So stirring your glaze efficiently is one of the key components to proper glazing. So especially when you first, you know, get in the studio, make sure you spend, you know, some quality time stirring this glaze up. I would say a good minute. So set a timer on your phone and stir. I like to keep a paper towel next to me. That way I can just kind of set that fork or spoon right on top of there um, and it's easy access. So now we're ready to start our first layer of glaze. Now that we have our glaze stirred up and ready to go, we're going to make sure that your bristles are moist. So dip it in water, run it under the sink or spray it um, with your water bottle. And then you're going to make sure that your brush has quite a bit of glaze on it. So you want it to be really, you want, you want it to like glopped on there kind of. Um, and most painting teachers would have a heart attack if they saw that, but that's really what you want for your glaze. Now, the other component to glazing is whatever direction you start in, it's a direction that you want to stay in. So notice that I'm going vertical and notice that I'm not really overlapping. So that glaze is going on there relatively thick. That's what we want. 
do not get in the habit of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, over and over again. Because if you do that, all you're going to do is pick the glaze up. And that's not what we want. So I'm gonna make my way around my form, dipping often, making sure there's quite a bit of glaze on, on my brush. And don't worry about the lines, like the brush strokes that appear, because that's all gonna melt away. Remember that your glaze has flux in it, and so that's gonna be that ingredient that causes, you know, there's other stuff in there too, but you'll learn that in Ceramics Tune 3. Um, for you, just know that this is going to melt, and so those brush strokes are gonna um, go away. So they're not an issue. And if you have some areas where the glaze isn't really going in there, just take your brush and kind of dab it, like so. So I'm gonna continue this process all the way around my art form from top to bottom. our second coat. Remember, I'm doing three of these and that's what I wrote down on my recipe sheet. But before I apply my second layer of glaze, I want to go ahead and restir this because while I've been waiting for my glaze to dry, my particles in my jar have fallen to the bottom. So we want to make sure that they're um, stirred up really well. So we're going to do another 40 to 60 seconds or so. And now I'm going to apply my second layer. Remember that my first layer, I went horizontal, so my second layer, I'm gonna go vertical. It doesn't matter which direction you start, just know that your second layer needs to be the opposite. Make sure you fill your brush, your bristles, and whatever direction you start in, make sure you stay that way. I mean, sometimes you get some tight areas and you just can't help it, and you do have to kind of alter your brush, and that's fine. That is perfectly okay. For example, in this Florida Lee right here, um, I just can't get around. I gotta get in those little spots, so I might have to switch to kind of a vertical brush stroke, and that's all right. apply that third layer and you guessed it I'm gonna stir my glaze up and I'm gonna switch directions once again so let's go ahead and do that of my exotic blue glaze on my piece. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply my second color right on top of this. The process that I just showed you does not change. You're going to apply your second color exactly the same. You're gonna pick a direction, you're gonna stay in that direction to cover the whole thing. You're gonna make sure that you stir your glaze in between layers between 40 to 60 seconds and then go the opposite direction that you did previously and you're gonna to continue to repeat this until you have three to four layers. Um, you definitely wanna make sure you do three, depending on the color, you may wanna do four. And if you're kind of questioning whether you should do a fourth layer, just ask me and I'll let you know what I think. Um, I've used pretty much every color. Well, not pretty much, I have used every color that we have. So I can probably give you some really good insight into your color combo. So don't um, be afraid to ask. The other thing that I wanted to mention, which I forgot to show you, 
is what whenever you are done with a layer on your paper, it's a really good idea to mark how many layers you've finished. So once you've finished a layer, just mark it right above your color name. That way you always know, because if you have to clean up and um, you're like, oh man, I didn't finish all three layers. If you, when you come back the next day or a couple days later, all you have to do is look at your recipe card and you're gonna know what layer you're on and what color you need. Now kids always tell me, oh, I won't forget, I know, and they don't. And if you wanna get even more um, exact, you could even, you know, when you go to record it, you could put what direction it is. So you could do uh, vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. So that would be even more specific, which the more notes that you can take when you're glazing and building, the better off that you are. And I just do it with my brush, so that way I don't have to pick up a pen. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start my next color, and it's gonna be the exact same process that I showed you before. bluebell so there will be my final application of glaze for the outside of this vase. A few things um, I just want to reiterate don't forget to stir your glaze 40 to 60 seconds switch directions in between layers and make sure you record on your paper um, how many layers you have and even better yet what direction that you have gone. <laughs> 